The average Christian today is vowless. And that's why we lack the skills on how to move the hand of God. What I want to show you now is a spiritual year. When a spiritual year begins. They say the academic year begins in September. When does a business year end? Huh? Begins in April. Yeah, so it ends in March, begins in April. All right. So a business year ends in March. That's when they balance all the books. They know how much profit came in for the 12 months of trading. They know all the losses and the deficits. The people that are still owing loans and they mobilize the police to arrest them. That's when they will know the level of deficit that is in the system. Because money will be going in, money will be coming out, bags of money will be coming in, there will be counting money, and it, it will be difficult for you to know where you are until that cycle is accomplished, all accounts are balanced. Then you know that, ah, this loan that was collected has not been paid and all of that. They can now calculate their profits. All of that is supposed to end in March. So a new business year begins in April. That is what I, I researched, okay? Well, I need to show you how to begin a spiritual year. Because just like everything is a cycle and there are principles on how to mobilize the cycle to, to commence, you must know what you need to do in order to commence a spiritual cycle. It is because of this I'd like to invite you to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. There was a certain man of Ramat Time Zophim. <laughs> These are the names I'm, I'm talking about. Of, the, of, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf and Ephratite. And he had two wives, and the name of the one was Anna, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Anna had no children. And this man went up, please take note, he went up out of his city yearly, underline yearly, to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now, you will notice that there is yearly in that scripture. And I'm trying to describe to you the things we need to do in order to commence a spiritual year. Just like my wife said that an academic year begins in September. So a spiritual year begins the moment you do this, which this guy does yearly. So what does he do yearly? He goes to worship. I hope I've told you that in order for you to accomplish worship, you must take one of the things that are due to God and you present it to him. That is worship. Notice that in this yearly worship, what he goes to present to God is what? It's a sacrifice. One of the things due to God, you must take it as you proceed to worship. Okay, go to verse 21, which is my emphasis, and that's where I'm going to stop for the night. 21. And the man Elkanah and all his house went to offer unto the Lord his yearly sacrifice and his vow. That yearly sacrifice there is first fruit. So he goes to commence his spiritual year by going to God with first fruit. The moment he has given first fruit, it means that he has reactivated the covering of God over his life for that year. That whereas others might die by Boko Haram, die by bomb, die by blight, he will not die by those. It is only when his days are accomplished that he can sleep with his fathers. So the question is, have you been really conscious about activating your spiritual year? 
That's why most of us end the year the way we started. There's no wisdom in our ways. He goes yearly with his sacrifice and his vow. That's how he goes to Shiloh. It's something deliberate. And he goes there not just with a sacrifice, he goes there with a vow. I don't have time to talk about vows because the average Christian today is vowless. And that's why we lack the skills on how to move the hand of God. You are confronted with the wall of Jericho, something that is humanly impossible, something that is impregnable. There are skills that you can put to work that can move God's sovereign hand. The man is going to trade with God. He's going to do business with God. He leaves his city and he, he journeys to Shiloh. He goes there with the sacrifice of first fruits. He also goes there to make vows and to redeem vows so that he can get God's commitment. There might be famine, but his own lands will be watered. There might be bloodshed, but his children will survive. There might be disaster, but he will look upon it on the right and the left and he will be spared. It is when you know this truth that you will hear tales of woe only from afar and it will be said concerning you, when they shall say there is a casting down, you will say, what? There is a lifting up. He goes to Shiloh to renew his covenant with God and that is how his spiritual year starts. Jehovah Sabaoth becomes his backing. And when, if you meet him in the office and you are looking for people to show wickedness, if you make a mistake and add him to the number, Sabaoth, that he came to sacrifice to at the beginning of the year, we appear in your dream. Yeah, he will appear in your dream with a weapon. And say you are a dead man. I'm behind that man. <laughs> you know, what I tell you is what I practiced. People that rose up in the office and say, This man is our problem. They were cut off. There are things you can do that will guarantee your preservation. So there are witches in your family. Let one carry your name. That, that's the last trip the person will go. I'm not saying it boastfully. I know where I'm talking from. There are things we do, yes, to move the hand of God. There are principles that God has put in place that if we practice, you'll be immune to the disaster that is coming. Please help me tell your neighbor, don't die, don't die. You can live until you are tired of life. Please, no one else should die. No one else in your family. No one else should die. And just in case you are listening to me online, I say you shall not die. Yeah. 